मैं आज आपके सामने I have come to you to renew my vow that we are accounting for each and every drop of blood of our martyrs. The score is being settled. Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif vows to fight terrorism after a suicide bombing kills more than 70 people in Lahore. Hello, I'm Arun Naidu in Washington DC and this is the heat. Since December, Pakistan has been rocked by a series of suicide bombings. One of the most devastating happened in late March when a powerful bomb ripped through a crowded park in the provincial capital Lahore, killing dozens of women and children. A faction of the Pakistani Taliban known as Jamaat ur arar claimed responsibility for the attack. In response, the government has launched another major offensive against extremist groups in the country's most populous province of Punjab. We begin with CCTV's Daniel Khan in Islamabad. Daniel, let's start with this group Jamaat ur Arar. What can you tell us about this group? Uh, well, Anand Jamaatul Ahrar is a breakaway a faction of the Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan. Uh, now, this splinter group uh, has launched uh, several attacks uh, on civilians and security forces in an attempt to boost its uh, profile among Pakistan's uh, militants that have been hit by a full-fledged uh, military operation in Pakistan's uh, tribal area since uh, the year 2014. Now, Umar uh, Khorasani uh, is uh, the head of Jamaatul Ahrar and a former leader of the uh, Tehreek e Taliban. Taliban Pakistan. He was uh, he established uh, this splinter group in 2014 after he was uh, overthrown by Mullah Fazlullah, the current uh, Tariq Taliban Pakistan chief. Now, uh, following internal, uh, there were very uh, a lot of differences uh, amongst the uh, um, different factions of uh, uh, the Taliban. Now, uh, this. Uh, be fighting for the establishment of uh, Sharia in Pakistan and has uh, some support in the uh, tribal areas. Now, the latest attack uh, was uh, the deadliest the December 2014 massacre of 134 children at the Army Public School in Peshawar by the uh, Taliban and uh, this attack has driven Pakistan's uh, civil military leadership to take on uh, the terrorists and uh, their facilitators not only in the tribal areas uh, but also in other cities of uh, Pakistan. Daniel, after the Lahore attack, Pakistan's military and police conducted raids in search of terrorists. Has that operation had any success? And is there any concern that there could be retaliatory attacks against the Pakistani people for these raids? Oh, well, certainly, Anand, the uh, experts believe that a reaction is inevitable uh, and uh, they, these uh, terrorists often hit uh, soft targets. Now, reportedly, Ahsanullah Ahsan, the spokesperson for uh, Jamaatul Ahrar, has warned Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, saying that the group uh, has... Uh, which is the capital of the most populous uh, Punjab province and the political power base of uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and his family. The uh, military rangers have uh, launched uh, joint uh, raids against militants in uh, central and southern uh, regions of the Punjab province and hundreds of uh, suspects and uh, their facilitators have been arrested and uh, Prime Minister Sharif has said uh, that uh, militants with political connections will be treated even more severely. Uh, now we know that uh, uh, the operation in the city of Karachi uh, already gave powers to the uh, paramilitary to conduct uh, raids and arrests uh, which experts say that has brought stability in the city after years of violence and lawlessness and they believe that uh, such operations are going to uh, uh, bring uh, of Punjab as well. Thanks, Daniel. That's CCTV's Daniel Khan reporting from Islamabad. Joining us now in our Washington is a scholar, public speaker, and the author of Secrets of the Kashmir Valley. From Islamabad, we're joined by Sultan Mahmoud Hali, Air Force and a television host with PTV News. Also with us in Washington is Ali Imran. He's the managing editor of Views and News magazine. And from Ithaca, New York, via Skype, we're joined by Raza Rumi. He's a policy analyst, journalist, and author from Pakistan. Thanks to all. Let me start with you. We look at this devastating attack at a park in Lahore in Pakistan. Dozens of people killed. What do you think was the motive behind the attack? Consistent with the movement of the Taliban, even though the perpetrators of this attack are a split. 
splinter group from the larger umbrella movement, uh, the objectives have always been the same, and that is to destabilize the Pakistani establishment in order to incite fear throughout the country. Uh, and by destabilizing the government, uh, they, these uh, local jihadi groups, see themselves as legitimate, uh, um, uh, uh, legitimate um, organizations. And most importantly, it's to create this Islamist utopia, which is is been, uh, you know, is very similar to what Daesh or ISIS has wanted, was to create an Islamic government in Pakistan. That is not only the group of the movement of the Taliban, but it's also been a consistent policy and then a political objective of other groups, um, even Al Qaeda, which has threatened the Pakistan establishment. Um, but the greater challenge is, you know, how do these groups intend to do that? Um, and 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 this kind of destabilization raises other serious, important counterterrorism challenges for the country at the moment. Ali, we heard a little bit about this group that has claimed responsibility from our report. The group is called Jamaat ul Aharar. Um, what else do we know about groups like this? You know, they seem to be, they seem to want to outdo each other on the level of violence they can perpetrate on civilians. Uh, yes, uh, the TTP, as we know it, the Hrike Taliban Pakistan, it has been waging... That's the Taliban in Pakistan. Yes, in Pakistan. It has been waging an insurgency against the Pakistani state uh, for the last about uh, eight, nine years. And this is a splinter group. And it's um, here in the Taliban uh, TTP has uh, splintered into various groups. And this is one of the groups. And its uh, leader, uh, Omar Khalid Khorasan, is said to be hiding in Afghanistan. They also um, carried out uh, attacks, high profile at attacks in the past, in the recent past. And as uh, Farhana said, that their aim is to destabilize and establish their you know, fear and their hateful ideology to, you know, in the name of religion, Islam, you know, to advance their obje objectives, which are literalist interpretations of Islam, and they want to impose Sharia as with other militant organizations. So. Sultan, in 2014, the Pakistan Taliban attacked an army school in Peshawar, and that caused the deaths of more than 140 people. The government responded at the time with its own action plan and said that uh, it was going to take on these terrorists. Um, what does this latest attack tell us about that action plan? Has, is it working? Has it failed? Well, uh, the national action plan was uh, long overdue in coming and it took a dastardly attack like the one on the army public school to actually galvanize the people as well as uh, get the government into motion to announce the national action plan. But my personal belief is uh, that the national action plan was uh, formulated in a little bit of a hurry and there are 20 points to it but uh, not more than three or four have been actually executed and the government is found lacking in most of them. The ones which are actually in action are the ones for which the Pakistan army was responsible. The civilians have been lacking in spirit or perhaps the will to go ahead because uh, they fear a backlash from the uh, extremist uh, is Islamic groups and even some of the Islamic political parties. And this has caused uh, a serious damage to the uh, government and the national plan to actually uh, carry out a, a serious attack or a seriously uh, address the issue of terrorism in Pakistan. Now, unless the government gets its act uh, together, and not only, uh, you see, revisits the National Action Plan because it, it requires a feedback, it requires retuning, it requires a, a consideration to see exactly what you just asked me, whether it's working or whether it's a failure and which aspects uh, need uh, a course correction. But that is uh, lacking for the time being. And uh, the attack uh, which you mentioned earlier, which our two, two other participants talked about at Lahore, has moved again, not the government, but the army into action, into going into uh, the heartland of Punjab but uh, apparently the army met with a little bit of resistance from the political forces so the government and the political parties they have to be on the same page to be able to attack or tackle the scourge of terrorism. Raza, here we have a situation where the Pakistani government is facing a major challenge. It's decided that it's going to take this war to the militants. It's going to take the war to the extremists. Is there a danger here that in response, these extremists carry out terrorist attacks against civilians, against soft targets? Yes, indeed, there is a danger. And, and you know, that is one of the considerations by the politicians, as was said uh, earlier. But the problem is that... Uh, 
this action cannot be delayed any further because uh, Pakistan has uh, brutally suffered, you know, more than 60,000 people have died in, in the past decade. And some of the key areas of national action plan, such as the regulation of uh, seminaries, you know, their registration and their regulation, because they are the ones that provide the manpower and the ideological basis for the terrorist groups to carry out these heinous attacks. So that cannot be delayed any further. And there are ways to uh, tackle uh, the backlash as well. Uh, but I think uh, what is perhaps not uh, uh, going on is that the political will that we need and the kind of uh, understanding between the military and the civilian leadership, uh, that needs to be cemented further. There is a problem over there. Farhan, getting to the point on where these groups get their support from, the British news magazine, The Economist, says that religious groups like the one that carried out this attack uh, in Lahore have been cultivated for years in Pakistan with Saudi Arabian money at religious schools or, as they know, madrasas. Do you believe that to be the case? Well, what I do think is true is that there is a culture of intolerance that has been breeding inside Pakistan for a very long time, and that cultural mindset um, has to change. And so the attack on Sunday was not just an attack against a Christian community. I mean, Christians have been attacked before. Last year, there was an attack against a colony of Christians who killed about a dozen people, and then attacks on churches. But more the, so, it's really an internal debate. There's an internal divide in Pakistan right now where Muslims have been killing Muslims. That sectarian tension has gone on far too long, and some of these groups, as Raza and some of the other experts have said here, which have been thrived, these local jihadi groups have also thrived in southern Punjab. And I think the other issue I'd like to raise is that this is, um, you know, there's willingness and there's also capability. For a very long time, Pakistan has um, conducted counterterrorism operations in, in places like Waziristan and the Swath Valley, and mostly in the tribal belt, and that's where their attention and focus has been. But there's been very little, um, as Raza mentioned, very little political will willingness to actually look at um, some of the, the proliferation of these very extreme madrasas and seminaries. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to be fair, Pakistan has taken them on when it is uh, when when these madrasas have taken on the establishment and there's been an, 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 you know and a threat and a threat a direct threat against the establishment but by and large I mean this is a uh, this is an issue that has been is deeply entrenched inside the society so it's not just local jihadi groups inside Pakistan which have proliferated and become more decentralized with time but it's also these seminaries and this cultural and religious mindset that needs to change but very quickly tell me was this an attack on a religious minority in Pakistan because there were many Muslims who were killed in that attack. Absolutely. Well. And so I think that it's a fair point and people have, and even though people would like to, you know, focus on the Christian minority, Muslims have also been killed and more importantly it was an attack on the establishment. The fact that it occurred in Lahore. I mean, when attacks were occurring in Pakistan for many years outside of the major cities, it was really less of a concern uh, for I think the general population. But I think people become very disenchanted and disillusioned and quite frankly disgusted when attacks take place in cities like Karachi, Lahore and Islamabad. All right. And Ali, if we look at the, sorry, you want to say something? Go ahead. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, continuing uh, uh, Farhana's point, this attack was um, pretty much uh, on the, in the cultural heart of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So uh, the battle and the war that is uh, that Pakistani state and Pakistani society are waging against militancy is for the soul of Pakistan. And if Pakistan has to succeed in this fight against militancy, the militant mm -hmm. mindset and extremism, it has to be won on the plains of Punjab. Because, you know, some of the militants who were uh, targeted by the Pakistani security forces during the Zerbe Azb operation in North Waziristan and other parts of the tribal agencies, some of them have made their way into Pakistani cities, and especially in the southern uh, part of Punjab, uh, and which has long been in a hotbed of sectarian terrorism and uh, militant organizations which uh, operate in the name of militancy. And then there are uh, long-standing issues like governance issues, mm -hmm. you know, the state has been able to proscribe, uh, has banned organizations, but now and then they again emerge with different names, then they collect money, contributions from people, and they are able to carry out these attacks. Then there are larger political issues in the region right, as well. But when you talk about success, how the Pakistani government overcomes groups like the ones we're seeing in Pakistan right now, the government tried to negotiate with the Taliban. It abandoned those efforts in 2014 and opted for a military option. Is there a military solution to this? This had, you know, at the, the immediate uh, 
solution that comes to mind and which uh, looks very much uh, practical and plausible is that the government, the uh, civilian security forces and the military forces, they have to move in tandem to at least, you know, nab those people, uh, shut down uh, their business, you know, and uh, uh, also at the same time uh, uh, suck out the oxygen from, you know, that is, you know, they collect money in the name of religion, you know, and they try to uh, hide behind the mask of civil, you know, service to the people like charities, you know, and the immediate, of course, is kinetic operations. But in the long term, as the national action plan lays out, we have to fight the militant mindset. And that has a lot to do with a lot of factors like uh, mainstreaming the madrasa education. And uh, a lot of uh, madrasas are mm -hmm. located in this uh, part of Punjab. And uh, according to a report, half of them are not even registered, you know. Uh, yes, Pakistan Army or Pakistani ISI did uh, sponsor them at times, but now they have come back to hit and bite the very hands that had fed them at one time, and they are not in anybody's control. So uh, it, it has to be a concerted effort. Uh, what uh, my other colleagues have said, I fully endorse that. The people of Pakistan have to be taken on board. So far, it is only the military which appears to be doing its bit. The government acts in uh, knee-jerk uh, reactions only when a major you see, uh, incident takes place. But uh, this, uh, the national action plan has to be across the board. It has to include uh, attacking and tackling the very roots of terrorism. Unless it is done and unless the people, every citizen of Pakistan contributes to it, these jihadis or what we call the terrorists or miscreants, they hide amongst the common people. It is very difficult to identify them. So unless the people of Pakistan cooperate, they realize, and then the pulpit is being used uh, of the mosque to inculcate jihad. The madrasas are being used, so they, they all have to be brought under a state control unless it is done. Hate literature is abolished, the terror financing is uh, rooted out and uh, stopped. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we are not going to win this war. Red Raza, as Sultan points out, the pulpit is being used in Pakistan to indoctrinate young people. There's something like 24,000 madrasas in the country, 2 million boys attending these madrasas. They teach a very highly conservative brand of Islam. What is the challenge for the government here? Is it uh, winning the hearts and minds of Pakistani youngsters backed by military pressure? A combination of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that is what the government has to do. You know, the parliament and the politicians, the media, they have the ability to sway and influence public opinion and and tell the people that you know we have to change the current state of things but you know about these madrasas see you you cited the figure 24000 one study says that there may even be more up to 40000 and that is the crisis that we actually don't know the extent of the problem we haven't had a census for 17 years and this these governance deficits have accumulated over over time so you see militancy and terrorism etc are not just about religious extremism, they're also about the very basic failings of the state. And let me also add that, you know, uh, mosques and madrasas are, are, of course, the key sort of driver, as we all have identified, but also the school curricula in Pakistan, which was also reshaped in the 1980s, you know, the earlier, uh, linking it to the earlier uh, talk about Afghan Jihad in the 1980s. So at that time, while, while Pakistan was uh, fighting this, uh, uh, you know, jihadist onslaught in Afghanistan, uh, there was a domestic process going on of Islamization of sorts, you know, it's a very uh, contested uh, right. uh, thing. Uh, and the textbooks were changed, which also teach, uh, you know, things about jihad and, and, and create a kind of a soft acceptance for uh, in, for violent extremism. And that is, that needs to go away. So this okay. is why we need far more comprehensive reform. Farana? Yeah. I appreciate, you know, the challenges that the Pakistani establishment has to deal with, and it's a real challenge where you're trying to quantify and, and, and qualify, uh, you know, the number of madrasas. But I think the real issue is really how do you change the cultural mindset of intolerance? And I see that progress has to be made from a bottom-up approach. This change has to come from within. And I, see, and you know, as very recently I've seen enormous progress take place. For example, there's an initiative in Pakistan. It's called the University Madrasa Interaction Program. It's led by a small NGO in Islamabad called um, uh, Code Pack, led by a friend 
friend of mine, Dilawar Khan, and what he has done is he spent four months um, bringing together students of the universities and also students of the madrasa. And in a series of workshops, by bringing these you know, young people together, uh, engaged in various dialogue. And these conversations have been robust, right. and that's actually what breaks down the barriers of intolerance. And also, but that can, that, again, that's a very small initiative. And what I'd like to add that the real challenge for local NGOs and for civil society actors who are trying to change this cultural you know, mindset of intolerance is that it needs to be well funded. And this particular project has only ran for four months and the report was just released, was funded by United States Institute of Peace right here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I applaud that effort, but more needs to be done. And quite frankly, funding and that support needs to also come from the Pakistani state. All right. Talking about the Pakistani state, Ali, is there another risk here for Pakistan? It is a fragile democracy uh, right now. When we look at the growing tension, the increasing amounts of violence and the government's response to it, could it lead to instability in Pakistan and ultimately to another military takeover? Um, at the moment, I don't think so. But uh, the latest uh, episode of uh, Panama Papers has also uh, pressured the political government and uh, the politicians, they have now platforms, they have to go to parliament, they have to explain to elected leaders, and there are debates going on in the media, in the electronic media, in the print as well. Uh, what the, uh, I mean, uh, democracy is absolutely imperative, mm. you know, for Pakistan. If Pakistan is to uh, overcome this militancy challenge, this uh, challenge of um, extremism and violence, not only in, um, uh, tribal areas bordering Afghanistan, but in the heartland and in the mainland, Pakistan has to uh, offer an economic hope, a, a economic hope to people, and it has to back up uh, its narrative of peace and peaceful coexistence with economic dividends. You know, unless Pakistan and Pakistan at this point, you know, again I would uh, come uh, come to the you know the timing of this operation, these developments is very very significant for Pakistan, as there is a big transition going on next door in Afghanistan, which uh, has been at war since 2001, uh, in the post 9/11 years, and it has been you know facing instability. But at the same time, Pakistan and China. They have, uh, they are pursuing a China-Pakistan economic corridor, right. which will uh, bring a lot of investment uh, into Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan will be able to have infrastructure. Its uh, uh, main, uh, you know, uh, Gwadar port will be operate. Uh, operational and that will bring economic dividends and all along uh, all the way from southwestern Balochistan province right up to the north and into you know uh, China uh, these and plus uh, there are energy projects as well mm -hmm. so Pakistan uh, has a very very uh, critical time this is very vital for Pakistan that it uh, aggressively moves against uh, extremist forces, forces of parochialism, and at the same time, uh, reform madrasas and uh, uh, other syllabus, you know, and uh, 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 offer a counter narrative, you know, that defeats the parochial narrow thinking and gives people hope okay. for the future. Okay. Sultan, uh, we've got uh, just a few seconds left, and I have to ask you this question about Pakistan's nuclear arsenal, because that is something that we hear uh, about very often here in the United States and in other parts of the world, concerns over the safety of this nuclear arsenal. How vulnerable are Pakistan's nuclear weapons? Can they by some, in some way fall into the hands of extremists? Well, uh, you see, Pakistan is a country that has developed its uh, nuclear program absolutely on its own. So if it has sophisticated and trained engineers to develop a nuclear program, they also have the capability to develop the necessary and requisite security and sa safety regimes also, which they have managed very well. Pakistan, in fact, is a little ahead of India in this, its neighbor with whom it was competing for, as far as the nuclear program was concerned. Pakistan developed a nuclear command authority and it has a, in place checks and balances which make sure that our nuclear arsenal, our nuclear weapons are absolutely safe and there's no way, there is just no way that uh, any rogue element can get hold of them. And uh, you see, the m m most important thing is that uh, people misunderstand that nuclear 
weaponry is not like, you know, lobbing a hand grenade or a missile. It is a very sophisticated thing, and I don't think a ragtag militia will be able to. But right. first of all, most importantly, they'll not be able to lay hands on it. Okay, and we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV underscore America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.